you have questions, the Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone from the studios of Murray State University in Murray, Kentucky. Once again, this is a Bible answer. Hello, I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Welcome to our program today. We have three gospel preachers with us to answer your Bible questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Robert Taylor. I'm a member of the Ripley Church of Christ, Ripley, Tennessee. I preach in gospel meetings, speak on lectureships, and engage in a daily religious writing ministry. My name is Hal Ferguson. I'm one of the ministers for the North Jackson Church of Christ in Jackson, Tennessee. My name is Adam Evans. I'm a student at the Memphis School of Preaching in the mission program there, and uh, will be headed to Tanzania, East Africa in August of 2013 to do mission work. We're enjoying very much having these good brethren with us today to answer your questions, and uh, we hope that you will tell other people about a Bible answer and encourage them to watch this program wherever it may be seen in your viewing area. Our first question today goes to Brother Adam Evans. Brother Evans, what is the definition of anathema? Brother Evans. If you look at the word anathema, as we find it in the text of the scriptures, it is a transliterated word from the original Greek word anathema. And the definition is a thing devoted to God without hope of being redeemed. And if an animal or as to an animal to be slain, therefore a person or thing doomed to destruction. A curse, a man accursed or devoted to the direst of woes. When we go back and look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in Leviticus chapter 27, verses 28 and 29, we read, Notwithstanding no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of a man and a beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed or ransomed, but shall surely be put to death. And so that is the idea that is promoted here of anathema or accursed. The idea of something that has been offered that there is no hope of redemption. Something that is doomed to destruction. And we find that that word is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. Also in the American Standard Version it is used in Romans chapter 9 and verse 3. It says, for I could wish that I myself were anathema or accursed from Christ for my brethren's sake. That's what Paul says in Romans 9 and 3. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. Wherefore I make known unto you that no man speaketh in the Spirit of God, saith Jesus is anathema or accursed. And no man can say Jesus is Lord but in the Holy Spirit. And in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven should preach any other gospel other than that which is preached unto you, let him be anathema. And in verse 9, as we have said before, so say I now again. If any man preached unto you any gospel other than that which ye received, let him be anathema or accursed. And so when we look in Acts chapter 23 and in verse 14, it says, And they came to the chief priests and to the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse. That is the word anathema in the original language in the Greek. That we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. So what does anathema mean? Doomed to destruction. Thank you for that question. Thank you. And now to Brother Tyler this question. What is the difference between the soul and spirit? Hebrews 4.12. Brother Tyler. The passage reads, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How can any person look at this passage of Scripture and refer to the Bible as being a dead letter, as being lifeless, 
This is one of the great passages in the New Testament emphasizing the power, the tremendously great power residing in the Word of God. The question has to do with soul and spirit. Sometimes they're used interchangeably to refer to the immortal part of the personality. But the word soul is used in a number of ways in the Old Testament and the New Testament. For instance, we're told that whenever the people of, Joseph, of Jacob's family went down into the land of Egypt, they are referred to as many, as many souls that went down into the land of Egypt. That refers to the entirety of the persons that went. Also, we read in 1 Peter, the third chapter, that there were eight souls that were saved by water. This refers to the entire person. In Acts, the second chapter, after Peter had told the people what to do on the day of Pentecost, the Bible tells us in Acts, the second chapter in 41, they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And so the word soul can be used to refer to the entire individual. In a passage in the book of Psalms, we're told that the word soul refers to the life of the individual. And so these are some of the instances in which the word soul is used. Also, it can refer to the part of the human personality that an individual cannot put to death. Jesus tells us in Matthew 10 and 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Therefore, the soul is that which cannot be destroyed by an enemy. An enemy can take our life, but cannot destroy the soul. And that's uh, the usage of the word soul as used in the Bible. The word spirit refers to the, to, the pers to the part of the personality that is immortal, that continues to live, and will continue to live throughout all eternity. We're told in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, or the 12th chapter, rather, that Jehovah God is the father of spirits. In the beginning of life, God places a spirit into the form of life, and that spirit will continue to live throughout uh, eternity. He's the father of spirits. The Bible tells us in James 2 and verse 26, for the body without the spirit is dead, but uh, he did not say that the spirit dies. It is the immortal part of man that continues to live. And this is one of the distinguishing things between man and animal. The animals of the field, the dog, the cat, the, the lion, the tiger, they do not possess a spirit. They do not possess something that will live forever and ever. This is one of the things that distinguishes man from the so-called animal creation. And I, for one, have always objected to referring to man as an animal. I do not believe that's uh, in harmony with the teaching of the Bible. We read about the beginning of animal life, uh, both in the air, both in the sea, upon the land, in Genesis, the first chapter. But when the Bible, Moses being the author, talked about the beginning of man and woman, there's something that is distinctively said, it, said about man and woman. Let us make man in our image. God did not say that to the other two about the lion, about the tiger, about the elephant, about the giraffe, about any animal that had just been made in the previous days. Man and woman have a distinctive uh, uh, distinction that is all uh, connected with our divine origin. And so soul and spirit have to be determined, especially so, by the context in the Bible. Thank you for the good question. Thank you, Brother Taylor. Uh, it's a difficult question. And now we'll give you this question, Brother Ferguson. Please discuss the difference between practices that the church does which are biblical and authorized and those which are local customs or traditions. Brother Ferguson. Thank you for the question. Practices in the church that are authorized by God are, are those that are discovered or are found which are either directly commanded, necessarily implied, or are an, an example of, of some underlying command or practice given elsewhere in the scriptures. To fully explain this would probably take a lot more time than we have in this, this session, but I'd like for us to just look at the three basic principles and, and an example of each one of these. When we're, think, we're talking about Bible authority, Bible authority is, is discovered or is found 
in three basic ways. And number one is w w Bible authority is found in the form of a direct command. For example, in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21, John writes, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now here we have a, an example of a direct command. It's very clear, it's very straightforward. Keep oneself from idol, from idolatries. Now to be a little more exact, this is a, a direct form or a direct command in the form of an exhortation. But now let me notice also there is the Bible, Bible authority is found in the form also not only of a direct command but also in the form of an example. And we can look at Acts chapter 20 in verse 7 where Luke records, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech unto midnight. Now here, in this particular text, Luke tells us that the disciples broke bread there on the first day of the week. Now, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and 29, we have Jesus with his disciples uh, instituting the Lord's Supper. Uh, there in that Passover feast. But the question is, well, when is this to be done? Jesus authorized that it should be done, that it must be done, but the question we would might ask ourselves is, well, when do we do this? Well, obviously, it was to be observed at some time because the, com the disciples were commanded to do that in Matthew 26. And we learn from 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, that upon the first day of the week is when the disciples come together. But uh, the Bible doesn't give us a direct command when to partake of the Lord's Supper. And yet, because we do have an account of the church doing that on the first day of the week, then it serves as an example, as recorded by the inspired writer Luke, of when the church is to observe the Lord's Supper. And that is on Sunday, the first day of the week. The reason is because it is an approved action of a command specifically given and an example of it being carried out by the church. But then, the, then Bible authority is found also in the form of an implication. And we can also use the same passage in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, I believe, to see how the Bible teaches by uh, implication. The text says, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Now, assuming that we understand that this is an example of when to partake of the Lord's Supper, that is the first day of the week, someone might ask the question and say, well, are we to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week? Or do we just take the Lord's Supper maybe once a year or twice a year or maybe once a month? How often? What is the frequency of partaking of the Lord's Supper? Well, remember the text tells us that it is on the first day of the week, Sunday. A simple question is in order. How many Sundays are there in a year? How many Sundays are there in a week? Well, we know that there is one Sunday in each week, and we know that there are generally 52 Sundays in a given particular year. And so even though the text doesn't tell us directly uh, that we are to take the Lord's Supper on every Sunday, it is implied because there is one Sunday per week, and there are 52 Sundays per year. Now, the difference in the practices of the church based upon these biblical principles is significantly different from the customs and traditions of men. For example, while Christians are authorized to worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, um, we might ask ourselves the question, well, at what time? Do we worship at 9 o'clock, at 9.30, or 10 a.m.? Or do we worship at 9 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night? Well, again, the, the Scriptures doesn't tell us exactly, but as long as it is on Sunday, as long as it is on the first day of the week, then we have met the requirement. The time we meet would simply become our custom, but it would not be obligatory on other congregations that might decide to meet at a different time, so long as they do meet on Sunday, the first day of the week. And so I hope that this helps to explain the difference between authorized uh, teachings, authorized biblical practices, and local customs. Thank you for this question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer you a free track. And our track today is entitled, the, Is the Church of uh, Jesus Built on the Earth Today? I don't believe we've ever offered this track before. You know, since it's not possible for any church to prove historically that it has existed from the time of the New Testament, is it even possible that the New Testament church still exists today? Yes, because it's not necessary to trace a line of succession back 2,000 years, 
And that possibility is easily proved by considering three simple principles that are discussed in this track. If you'd like to have this track, or if you would like our free eight-lesson Bible correspondence course written by Brother Alan Webster, we'd be happy to send any of these materials to you. They're absolutely free of charge. You may also send us your question, of course. We would very much like for you to do that. So you may contact us by writing us. Our address is Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. Our email address is a Bible answer at earthlink.net. Our toll-free number is 1-800-436-0463. Remember now that if you get the answering machine, please, you must leave your full address. And this number is for literature request and also for uh, sending us your questions. We're also pointing people to our new web address, www.abibleanswertv.com. Go there, won't you? And check out what we have to offer on our new website, www.abibleanswertv.com. Back to our questions today. Our next question to Brother Evans. Brother Evans, how could a corrupt person like Caiaphas prophesy John 11, 49 through 52? Brother Evans. Let's look at that text, uh, John 11, 49 through 52. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And it appears to be the case that, yes, Caiaphas, he was a wicked individual, but it appears to be the case that he was not aware of the prophecy that he was actually making beforehand. He states this, and the scriptures mentions it, that he states it not of himself. And it's possible that he didn't even realize that he was making this particular statement. And it can be the case that the words of men can be the words of God at the same time. That the words of an individual, they actually may be wicked. Uh, his motivation might be sinful. And yet, still the speech or the words that are spoken, still according to the will of Almighty God. And so, I believe, based upon this text, that his words were intended for evil and meant for evil. But God spoke truth through his words. And we find other times in the scriptures that there were those that were looking right into the face of God's providence and his will and didn't realize what was taking place in Genesis chapter 50. Verse 19, you have Joseph, who had gone through many things in his life and yet had been forsaken by his own brothers, and yet they had come to him. And in verse 20, he says to his family, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. It appears to me that in this text, Caiaphas makes this statement, you know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should perish not. And then it would appear that John continues to make the statement here as he is looking back upon an occasion that he was able to witness firsthand and that he mentions this, that he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he should gather together and one the children of God that were scattered abroad. And so it appears that this is John's commentary based upon that particular statement that Caiaphas had made. John chapter 18 and verse 14 also gives us insight. It says, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And so he was making a statement based upon expediency at the time that it would be beneficial for them to execute our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Brother Evans. Our next question to Brother Taylor, and this is something I think a lot of people are mixed up on. Please discuss the doctrine of transferred righteousness. Brother Taylor. Thank you for the question. It is a popular topic and one in which many people have uh, suggested their belief in the same. I do not believe that it has any kind of biblical basis at all. 
For instance, the Roman Catholic people for years have had a doctrine, they have a rather long name for it, for superior gation, and it basically amounts to a bank of good works. The contention is that there's some people, maybe like Stephen, Paul, and others, who had such an abundance of righteousness, even more than was needed in their case, and that the surplus of their good works could be used for the deficient who come up lacking in righteousness. A rather convenient doctrine, a comfortable doctrine, if it were only based upon the truth. But I do not believe it's based upon the truth at all. We're told in Acts 10, 34 and 35, and this is a statement that the Apostle Peter makes of the household of Cornelius. He said, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and doeth righteousness is accepted with him or of him. Notice that righteousness is something that is done. And then a very crystal clear passage we have in 1 John 3 and verse 7. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. The concept seems to be that the righteousness of Christ can be, uh, uh, tr can be credited to the person who comes up deficient. I do not believe that's the concept of righteousness at all. The late and lamented guy in Woods used to say that the basic meaning of righteousness is right doing. And of course, included in that right doing is right thinking and right speaking and right deeds or right habits. This constitutes righteousness. Whenever the Apostle Paul, near the end of his colorful career as an apostle, as a Christian, was writing the faithful evangelist on the island of Crete, Titus by name, he said that there are three requirements to live soberly, righteously, and godly. There is to be a denial of ungodliness and worldly lust. But each one of these maintains activity upon our part. We're active in being sober. We're active in being righteous. We're, acting, we're active in being, being godly. I believe that a perfect understanding of this would go a long way in helping us to understand something that is found in the parable of the, of the virgin, five of whom were wise and five of whom were foolish. And when the bridegroom came, the foolish vir virgin said to the wise virgin, give us of our oil, for our lamps are going out, literally have gone out. And some people would suggest that the answer that was given by the wise virgins meant, um, uh, indicated that they were selfishness, that they refused to share. And so the wise suggested not so, lest there be not enough for us to, and for you. You go and buy from those that sell this product. And they were asking to receive something that the wise virgins could not transfer. The oil there is the oil of preparation, the oil of readiness, the oil of uh, righteousness, and that was something that they could not transfer from themselves to the foolish virgin. And so righteousness is something that we do, and it cannot be transferred from another individual. There's an interesting passage of Scripture in Ezekiel, the 14th chapter, in which the great major prophet in the captivity period referred to two men of the past and then is to contemporary. He said that even if Job and Noah and Daniel were in the land, they could only deliver themselves. They could not deliver other people. Of course, two of these had lived in the past, namely Job and Noah, and Daniel was still living at the time. But they, of course, were righteous individuals, but they could not impart their righteousness to other individuals. You're not righteous because I may be. I'm not righteous because you may be. Righteousness is something that is personally done and not something that can be transferred from one individual to another individual. This has been my understanding of this for many, many years. I've given it a great deal of consideration. I've already often written about it, and I believe this is in harmony with the teaching of the Bible. Thank you for this good question. Thank you very much to Brother Taylor, Brother Ferguson, Brother Evans for doing such a great job today in answering your Bible questions. We want to extend our thanks to our supporting congregations. I want to list them now. Churches of Christ in Anna, Illinois. The Bishop Street Church of Christ in Union City, Tennessee. The Bradford Church of Christ, Bradford, Tennessee. 
the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri, where I labor, the Dexter Church of Christ in Dexter, Missouri, the Doris Chapel Church of Christ in Trenton, Tennessee, the Fairview Church of Christ, Milan, Tennessee, the Front Street Church of Christ, also Milan, Tennessee, the Fremont Church of Christ, Union City, Tennessee, the Gardner Church of Christ, Martin, Tennessee, the Gideon Church of Christ in Gideon, Missouri, the Greenfield Church of Christ in Greenfield, Tennessee, where I used to labor and have many friends. The Locust Grove Church of Christ in Bradford, Tennessee. That's Brother Taylor's home congregation. The Main Street Church of Christ in Troy, Tennessee. The Marion Church of Christ, Marion, Illinois. Matthews Church of Christ, Matthews, Missouri. The Mount Zion Church of Christ out in the hills from Hornbeak, Tennessee. The Mounds Church of Christ in Mounds, Illinois. The Nance Church of Christ in the country outside of Alamo, Tennessee. The Neboville Church of Christ in the country near Yorkville, Tennessee. The New Johnsonville Church of Christ, New Johnsonville, Tennessee. That is the easternmost border uh, where a Bible answer reaches just across the Tennessee River. The Palmersville Church of Christ, Palmersville, Tennessee. The Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, which is the overseeing congregation for the work of a Bible answer. We appreciate them very much. The Pleasant Hill Church of Christ in Trenton, Tennessee. The Portageville Church of Christ, Portageville, Missouri. The Ripley Church of Christ in Ripley, Tennessee, where Brother Taylor was preacher for many years and continues to live and to labor there and work with that congregation. The Sanford Church of Christ near Steele, Missouri. The Sharon Church of Christ, Sharon, Tennessee. The Spring Creek Church of Christ in uh, Hickory, Kentucky. The Troy Road Church of Christ in O'Bion, Tennessee. The Yorkville Church of Christ in Yorkville, Tennessee. And the Whitlock Church of Christ near Paris, Tennessee. 32 congregations of the Churches of Christ throughout uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Southern Illinois, and also southeastern Missouri. We're appreciative to each one for the financial support that they give us so that we may bring a Bible answer to you without any financial solicitations whatsoever. I'm sure that you know that this is different from a lot of religious programming on television today. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer Today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.